Susie Dalrymple and I were, <clears throat> were visiting before the first service, and, and we were talking about magicians and how a magician works. And, and the way that a magician works is that they get your attention and focus so on something that you don't pay attention to what they're doing someplace else. And then all of a sudden we say, oh, that's magic, because I didn't see it happen, and it happened. I don't know how they did that. Well, it's really simple. The way that they did it was to get you distracted, to get you focused on something else. And we were talking about how easily that can happen to us as Christians, to where we can get easily focused on something else and forget what we're primarily supposed to be all about. You know, for instance, you know, how's your New Year's resolution doing? Uh, you know, I visited with Jeff uh, on Friday, and, and Jeff's still having to compete for uh, exercise equipment at the gym. So, you know, obviously there are some people whose uh, New Year's resolutions are still going on, and if yours are still going on, that's just great. So, what's going to be different in your life during the next week? You may say to yourself, well, I... I need to study my Bible more, and so that's my goal for the next week. Or, or you may say, I need to spend more time in prayer. Or, or you may say, you know, my mind wanders while I pray, so I think I'm going to get a prayer journal, and I'm going to write it down, and as I'm writing it down, I'm going to pray about it, and that way I'll keep focused on what I need to do. Or, or you might say, you know, I need to get the oil, change my car this week, or, or I might need to clean the garage this week. Uh, and and you've got a list of things that you need to do in the week. And all those are really good things to do because your car is probably going to fall apart if you don't. Uh, uh, but in the process of, of this, those are good things. And sometimes we can sacrifice what is the best thing with good things to where we're concentrating on the things that need to be done, even in relationships. You, you, you have a friend who's in a time of struggle, and, and you say to yourself, I need to, need to send them a card. I need to give them a call. I, I need to do that. That's a good thing, but that's not the best thing. Because remember, Jesus told his disciples, he said, go, make disciples, baptize them, and teach them again whatever things I have commanded you. That is the best thing, because for me and for you here this morning, the only thing that really matters is where you're going to spend eternity. The only thing that really matters with the people that you're going to be around this week are where they're going to spend eternity. But we can forget the best thing and concentrate on the good things and not be about our Father's business. And then the magician, you know, the evil one, Satan, uh, he's really good. He causes us to focus on something over here while he's doing something else. And we go, wow, how did that happen? Well, it happened because we were not focused on what is the best thing. So in order for us to share the gospel message with other people, there's some things that I think we need to take a look at in our life to see whether we're ready to share the gospel message with other people or not. Pick up with me, if you would, in the book of Isaiah, the 52nd chapter, verse 7 and following. It says, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Your watchmen shall lift up their voices, with their voices they shall sing together, for they shall see eye to eye. Now, I, I, I don't know about you, but you probably disagree with me on some things, uh, and I probably disagree with you on some things. So how is it we can see eye to eye? Well, every last one of us can see eye to eye on God. Because there is only one God. And when I'm focused on that one God, you're focused on that one God, we see eye to eye. Our opinions may differ, but our relationship to God is what unites us together. Focused on God, they shall see eye to eye when the Lord brings back Zion. Break forth into joy, sing together, you waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Depart, depart, go from there, go uh, touch no unclean thing, go out from the midst of her, be clean, you who bear the vessels of the Lord. Now, this be clean part here, this was a big deal to Israel because they, they had cleanliness statues. If you touch something unclean, you had to go through a ceremony to get be clean again so that you could handle the things of God. 
Now, we're going to leave this in the Old Testament because this was dealing with physical things. They had to cleanse themselves. They had, they had a, a, a labor there. They had to go ceremonially wash their hands to get rid of the, their touching the unclean things so they could be clean again, so they could be about the things of God. Everything that's in the Old Testament is physical. Everything that is in the New Testament is spiritual. So we bring this over, and he says, before you bear the vessels of God, you need to be clean. Before you can tell other people about the gospel message, you need to be clean. I need to be clean. So how does that work? Well, the Holy Spirit's job, as we see in John uh, the seventh chapter, verses eleven and through thirteen, is for us to to give ourselves to God, and then God can come into us and dwell in us. And how we're clean is because the Holy Spirit is going to convict us of the sin that is in our life. That's God's job. The Holy Spirit's going to kick and convict me. He's going to convict you. Our response to that is repentance of coming to the place of saying, this is what God wants for me and I'm not there. God, please forgive me for this, of whatever's going on in my life. Either God has said, don't do that, or he has said, do do that. And we have said, I don't think I want to just yet. And we repent of our sin. So that's our response to God. When we're convicted of sin, we need to repent. And therefore, we clean up our heart. But it doesn't make it a clean heart. In Psalm 51, and this is a psalm that David wrote after his sin with Bathsheba. And just to, to, to remind you of that, he saw Bathsheba sunbathing, looked at her, and he wanted her. So he had her come to him, and, and uh, they, they had sex together. She got pregnant. I uh, called uh, Uriah, her husband, home, said, you know, you need to go lay with your wife. And he said, no, I can't do that while well, my men are in battle. So he sent him back out into battle and had him killed in the process of that. And, and there was probably six to nine months after this that nothing seemed to take place. Nothing seemed to happen. David's conscience was not pricked. You know, everything was working out fine. Nobody knew the better. Uh, and so I, I, I say that because I think sometimes we commit sin in our life and nothing happens. Sky didn't fall in, you know, the house didn't fall down. A uh, car's still running fine, so we think everything's fine. Six to nine months later, Nathan comes to David, and he says, you know, I, I got a story to tell you. And he begins st telling the story, and in the end, David is convicted of the sin that is in, in his life, and he repents of the sin that is in his life. And after that, then he wrote the 51st Psalm. Pick up with me, if you would, in verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Now, because I repent of my sin doesn't mean I create a clean heart in me. All it means is that I give permission to God to now give to me a clean heart. I have responded in repentance to his conviction, and in the process of that, my heart is clean. But God needs to give me a clean heart. He says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Steadfast means constantly focused. Steadfast, a spirit within him. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Now, uh, everybody at one time in their life as a Christian has experienced times of great joy and great peace. And they just really like that. And then they get to a place of darkness. They get to a place where it, life doesn't make sense and there's no joy. You know, I come to church and I sing songs, there's no joy. Uh, I read God's word, there's no joy. And so what do I need to do? And, and typically what we do is we focus on outside things around us that need to change. David understood that the joy of God's salvation was going to be given to him by God. Restore him to the joy of God's salvation. And we must do the same thing. If I lack joy in my life, if I'm a saved individual, I'm not experiencing joy, it's not for my job to go out and to create joy. It's my job to surrender to the one who can give me joy. He says, restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with your generous spirit. Notice what he says, then I will teach. I will open my mouth and I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. Now, I, the, the times in your life that you've been very joyful, were you able to keep it in, contain it, not do anything with it? You know, that's quite unlikely because most of the time when people have great joy, it bubbles out of them. It's bubbling all over everybody else and everything uh, to the point where people would say, you know, back off, uh, slow down. You know, uh, I, I'm not prepared to handle this. And the person who's experiencing great joy can't. 
So if I'm not bubbling all over people, then probably I don't have anything bubbling inside of me. And so rather than trying to figure out how to bubble on people, I need to go to the Lord and say, restore within me the joy of your salvation. So that, and he, he, he gives it, create me a clean heart, restore, uh, give me a, a, a renewed spirit, uh, don't take your presence from me, uh, restore me the joy of your salvation, and then I'm going to tell people. I'm going to tell people about their transgressions, and sinners will be converted to you. Converted. Uh, that's what the world needs today is conversion from the world's way of doing things to God's way of doing things. How are they going to get there? Because somebody says something about it. David says, do this for me and I will teach transgressors and they will be converted. Because it is about you, God, and what you have done to me. So, you know, this create in me a clean heart is a very necessary thing in order for me to tell other people about the Lord Jesus Christ. To tell them about the plan of salvation. The plan of salvation is not hard. You know, anybody here this morning can do this. You can start in the front of your Bible and you can write on your blank page, you can write something here that says, you know, uh, there's a, a, a passage that has to do with faith. You turn to that passage out beside it, you've got written a passage that goes to confession. Go to confession. There's a passage written out beside it that you've written there that talks about repentance. Uh, a passage that then to the next one is about baptism and then about living the regenerated life. And, and you, it, it's so simple that any of us can do it and any of us can share it. And it doesn't really make any difference where you start because the whole of the word is pointing at Jesus Christ. In the book of Acts, the eighth chapter, this is the story of Philip, the Ethiopian eunuch. And the, the Ethiopian eunuch was studying the book of Isaiah. And, and, you know, you, you would look at the Isaiah and you would say, well, that's not a very uh, uh, evangelistic type uh, book. It's a, a book of prophecy. You know, so how in the world is he going to make the leap from the book of Isaiah to talking about Jesus Christ? What, what, what we need to know is that the whole of the book of Isaiah is talking about the Messiah. Chapter 49 of the book of Isaiah and following the 52nd chapter we just read from is talking about the comfort that is going to come from the Messiah. So it is not difficult to go from the book of Isaiah to talking about Jesus Christ. And so he, he didn't have the New Testament at this time. You know, Philip didn't have the New Testament. You and I do. But they did not at, at this time. Uh, the letters were written to the church at Corinth and Thessalonica, uh, Philippi. And then later, much, much later after the time of the apostles, the canon of the Bible was drawn together for the New Testament. These guys didn't have the New Testament, so they relied on what had already been given to them, but it became the foundation of their relationship as they were talking to people about the Lord. Pick up with me, if you would, in the book of Acts, the 8th chapter, verse 31. And he said, how can I? And, and the question is, do you understand what you're reading? And, and this is the response of the Ethiopian eunuch. How can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. And by the way, Philip ran to the Ethiopian eunuch. He just didn't stroll over there. He wasn't hesitant about it. He knew what his job was. He ran to the Ethiopian eunuch. And it says, the place in the scripture which he read was, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter, like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does this prophet say this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached to him Jesus. Preached to him Jesus. Now, if you follow the rest of this story, he preached to him Jesus. They saw water and the eunuch said, so what hinders me from being baptized? So the gospel message is not just that there's, there's a, a Savior come into the world, but it's also how do you get to be a part of the Savior? Here's water, what hinders me to be baptized? Now, I need to say this because, you know, most of us are a little bit salesman weary. So when we suspect somebody's trying to sell us something, we have learned the art of deflect. Change the subject. Move on to something else. And so, you know, you, you've, you've got one of your friends or, or somebody that you're talking to, a member of your family, 
And, and, and you're saying, do you want to know the, the gospel message? And they say, well, yeah, I kind of like to know that, at least your version of what the gospel message is. And so you start telling them about faith, and, and you've taken your, your next scripture, and you've moved to confession. And they say, that brings me to a question. And you say, oh, well, what's your question? And they say, well, was God married? And you're thinking, how did we get from confession to uh, whether God is married or not? And you're going to be polite, and you're going to say, well, no, God wasn't. Well, where does it say that in the Bible? And so you're going to go back to the book of Genesis, and you're going to start in the book of Genesis. Pretty soon, hours went by, and you've talked about heaven and hell, and you've talked about whether God was married or not, and you didn't get to the gospel message because they learned the art of deflect. If somebody is pinning you into a corner and you're not comfortable being there, then you deflect the situation. I did that in, in college. I think probably everybody did. You know, we were talking about a subject, and I wasn't prepared to talk about the subject. I hadn't read my, my homework. And, and so I didn't want the professor asking me questions that I couldn't answer, so I'd ask him questions. And just as soon as he got done off of that rabbit, I sent him on another rabbit. And so we get done with the class, and I'm thinking to myself, well, I did that really good because we didn't cover the subject. We can't be tested on it tomorrow. He said, you did that really good. And because you did, tomorrow you're going to be tested on what we didn't study today. So choice is up to yours the next time you want to try this. And so I, I learned not to do that. But people will do that with you when you're sharing the gospel message. Stick to what you're talking to them about. Because the most important thing in the whole wide world isn't whether they understand creation or not. It's whether or not they are saved. Period. The most important message I will ever share with anybody, the most important message you will ever share with anybody, is how they can come into a saving relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the most important message. So, you know, this person's going through a hard time. I need to send them a card of encouragement. I need to give them a telephone call. I need to take them by a plate of cookies. Uh, all those are good things, but those good things can never replace what is the best thing, and that is sharing the gospel message with people who are wanting to know how to deal with life. In the book of Acts, 17 chapter, verses 2 and 3, now we already talked about the book of Isaiah and how important it was that he take the book of Isaiah and talk about Jesus Christ. Notice what it says here, Paul. Then Paul, as his custom was, went to them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. Now, he wasn't using the New Testament because the New Testament wasn't written yet. So he was taking everything that was in the Old Testament and he was saying, this is how we come to the place of a Christ. And this Jesus whom you crucified is the Christ. So it's so important for us to understand the power of the Word as we're dealing with each other. It's not important what I think. It's not important what you think. It is important what God says. So I need to know what God says so I can share it with you so that you can share it with me. 27th verse of the 18th chapter, the same book says, and this is Apollos. And Apollos was a, a very gifted speaker. And, and he, once he got a hold of something, he went out and told everybody about it. And so Priscilla and Aquila heard him talking one day, and he was talking about the baptism of John. So they pulled him aside, and they instructed him about the baptism of Jesus. Well, that just gave him more, more fuel for his fire. And so in the 27th verse, it says, And when he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. For he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the Scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. Showing from the Old Testament that Jesus is the Christ. Yes, the, 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 all of the Scripture points to Jesus Christ. The Old Testament points to Jesus Christ. The New Testament points to Jesus Christ. Everything in the Word points back to Jesus Christ. So the power is not in us. You know, you can learn all sorts of, of nifty things. I've got books in my library. I'd be glad to give them to you because uh, I probably, I'm never going to read them. But they, they had interesting titles to me. Your words have power. And, and, and of course, you can, you can take and, and understand that great orators use power phrases. They use power words to accomplish what they want in, in, in somebody. 
Now, uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is not a, a slam, so if you're a Democrat, don't take it as one, please. But the most gifted orator that I have ever heard is President Obama. He knows how to use words. He is very persuasive. He can take things that are wrong and make them seem right. He can take things that are bad and make them seem good. And in the end, people say, yeah, pick me. I want that. He is so gifted. And so we can get to the same place where we think what we need is uh, to have that same ability. Well, I'm going to demonstrate differently from that. In the 15th verse of the second uh, chapter of 2 Timothy, it says, Be diligent to present yourself proved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. It is not important that I know right words, good words, and the power that goes along with those words. It is important that I know the word of truth and understand its importance and value and how it applies to life, how it applies to salvation, how it applies to Jesus Christ, how it applies to everyday life. And we're confronted with that all the time to where we're going to have opportunity to speak up and, and to say something about the best thing in life. And the best thing in life is salvation. We're all going to die. We accept that fact. It is not a question of whether we're going to die. It's a question of where we're going to spend eternity after we die. That is what is most important. And the Word of God is a powerful tool in our hands, in our relationship to each other, in our relationship to the world, in our relationship to the people that we are around. The same book, again, the third chapter, verse 14, it says, But as for you, continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures. Now, that is our reason for our children's ministry. It takes place both in the first and the second service. Uh, Duane takes care of it in the first service, and, and others take care of it in the second service. But the whole point is to acquaint, educate, to get people to know the Holy Scriptures, because it will lead and guide our thoughts and our thinking. It will lead us to where God wants us to be which are able to make you wise for salvation. The Word of God is able to make us wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture, now this is what we believe categorically as, as Christians, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Uh, a better way to put that, it's probably more picturesque for us, is God breathed. God breathed the Scriptures, and therefore it's what God wants us to know. And it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, why is that important? Well, the reason that that's important is because we're going to be equipped for everything that needs to be done in life. It is not up to us to figure out how this is going to be. It's already been given to us. God has already told us how it's going to be. He's already told us what's important. He's already told us what's eternal. Don't have to figure that out. We don't have to weigh it against what the world says. God has already given it to us. And it's important that we believe that this is God-breathed, God information, God's knowledge, what God has given to us as far as how we can live our life. In the book of Acts, the sixth chapter, verses 9 and 10, and this is important for us because uh, we, we, we are people who uh, uh, look at the people that we're around differently. We look at some with, uh, with power. We look at some without power. It says, Then they arose, there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those of Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. And in your Bible, the word spirit should be capitalized because it is not talking about his spirit. It is talking about God's spirit, the Holy Spirit that was within him. Now, why is that important? Well, the word of God is a tool. Being clean is, is a part of our preparation. And, and yet, it is not just the word. It is the spirit of God within us. Remember we talked about just a couple weeks ago that the Spirit was promised. The Comforter would come after Jesus left, and the Comforter would bring to remembrance the things that, that had been given to them, and so that they could use them. And, and so it, it's not important for us to think, well, I, I need to go to Bible college, I need to read more books, I need... No, 
We've been given the Word of God. We've been given the Spirit of God so that that can change us. And He will give to us the things that we have need of so that we can give it away to other people. In the book of 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, it says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with the excellence of speech or wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. Notice, he didn't, he, he didn't read the right books. He, he, didn't, he didn't read the word that said, you know, the book that said, your words have power and you can influence people. He didn't, he didn't read the Dale Carnegie stuff. You, you know, he didn't have any of that stuff. No, it says that I didn't come to you with excellence of speech. It goes on, for I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. One thing he went for, and it was so that people would know Jesus Christ and him crucified. He was determined. He wasn't going to get off on, on rabbit chases. Uh, he wasn't going to go down the rabbit hole. He was going to stay focused on what it was that he wanted other people to know. Jesus Christ and him crucified. And that was the main thing that he wanted to get across to those people while he was there. It goes on. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. With, and my speech and my preaching were not with the persuasive words of human wisdom. He didn't read the right books again. You know, he, he, he didn't need to read the right books. Why? Because he had the Spirit of God. He had the Word of God. He was totally equipped for everything that he had need of in speaking the gospel message to folks. But in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, and Lynette, if you have the next verse, please put that up as well, uh, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now, great orators have come along all throughout history, and, and you can listen to their speeches, Socrates and Plato and, and people like that. You know, it's not just today that we have great orators. We've always had great orators who understood the power, how to use power phrases, how to put things together in such a way that people are going to respond, even though they're not, not knowing they're responding. Great orators have always been there. And what Paul says is, I don't want you to listen to me because I speak well. I don't want you to listen to me because I'm persuasive. I want you to listen to me because the Spirit of God is speaking to you. And I want you to speak back to the Spirit of God. I want you to enter into that relationship. And the only thing that is important that I wanted you to know, and this is what Paul said to the church at Corinth, is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Remember we started off with the best thing that any of us are ever going to do in somebody else's life is share with them the gospel message. That's the best thing. So I want you to think back over your last week. Uh, the important things that you accomplished last week was one of those important things to share the gospel message with somebody who is a part of your life. Because you may have accomplished a lot of good things. You may have done a lot of good things. And you may have changed a lot. You know, and, if, and if you lost three pounds last week, great. Great on you. If you didn't lose three pounds last week, uh, that, that's, that's great too. Because in the space of eternity, whether you lose 50 pounds or not is not going to change your eternity. It may change how quickly you get there, but it is not going to change your eternity. Because the most important thing for me and for you and for the people who are sitting beside you is the gospel message of Jesus Christ. How beautiful are the feet of those on the mountains who bring good tidings, who bring peace. Have you been doing a lot of good things? And are you doing the best thing? Pray with me, please. Lord, thank you that it doesn't depend on us. It depends upon our focus on you. And the evil one would want to distract us and to get our attention elsewhere and to keep us there so that we never get to what is most important, the best that life has to offer, and that is living in salvation and sharing that salvation with others. So, Lord, may your spirit work in us, I pray. In the name of Jesus, amen.